In this video, I'm going to share with you a protocol for supporting lung detoxification. Our lungs have been under increasing stress over the last several decades. Pollution from vehicles makes living in some cities the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Increased forest fires blanket portions of our country with smoke for weeks at a time. The 400 million tons of plastic that are made each year which end up in landfills are fragmented by ultraviolet light into microplastics, some of which get into the atmosphere and eventually our lungs. As of 2019, we now have gain of function viruses to contend with. And in the future, we may have the threat of self spreading vaccines to deal with as well. So what specifically do we need to do to detoxify and support our lungs in this modern world we find ourselves in? Let's start with particulate matter like smoke and microplastics. Our ability to remove particulates depends on the size and the electrical charge of the particulate. Larger positively charged particles get stuck in the negatively charged mucus of our lungs and our cilia, the tiny little hairs in our lungs, push the mucus and trapped particles up and out of our lungs at about a half an inch a minute. If these larger particles are negatively charged or neutral, they don't get stuck in the mucus so much as dissolved in it. It takes longer to get these particles out, but they too can be removed by the mucus and cilia. Our first challenge is how can we deal with the very small particles that can find their way past the mucus and cilia defense systems into our alveoli. Alveoli are the tiny sacs which absorb oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. We have approximately 400 million of these little alveoli sacs in our lungs. There is no mucus or cilia in the alveoli to clean particulate out. Mucus in the alveoli would make breathing very difficult. So to get rid of the tiniest particles that reach our alveoli, we rely on our white blood cells to clear them out. White blood cells do this in three ways. First, they can try to digest the particles. Second, they can pass them into the lymphatics for removal. And third, they can escort them out of the alveoli, at which point they're trapped in the mucus and the cilia move them out. Regardless of which way the white blood cells deal with particulate in the alveoli, they must first know they are there. These particulates must be tagged for removal. This is done by special proteins in the lungs called lung surfactant proteins. There are four different lung surfactant proteins that our lungs make, namely A, B, C, and D. It is lung surfactant proteins A and D that both bind the tiny particles together into little clumps, as well as tag them for removal by the white blood cells. Since lung surfactants have both a positive and negative side to them, the technical term is zwitterionic, they can bind to both positive and negatively charged particles. Neutrally charged particles are a little trickier to deal with. To get rid of very small neutrally charged particles from the alveoli, it may be helpful to induce a negative charge onto them with something like our electron charger. A second challenge is leaky membranes. Many of us have an overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria in our intestines and body, and these can also translocate to our lungs. Gram-negative bacteria produce a compound called lipopolysaccharide, which causes organs to leak. In order to efficiently move oxygen in and carbon dioxide out of the body, the alveoli of the cells are only one cell wall thick. This efficiency comes at a price, and that is fragility. For this reason, it is important to both decrease the production of lipopolysaccharides as well as remove any that have gotten into the lungs. Additionally, we want to try to clear out any gram-negative bacteria that may be creating these lipopolysaccharides. Fortunately, lung surfactant protein A can bind to and neutralize lipopolysaccharides in the lungs. To learn how to decrease gram-negative bacteria in the body, you can look at our Phylomet and Lactomet products. A third challenge is viruses and other pathogens. Our white blood cells can kill and remove infections, but just like the particulates in the alveoli, 
infectious microbes also need to be tagged by lung surfactants so the white blood cells can see them better. Specifically, lung surfactant proteins A and D are the ones associated with microbial defense. Lung surfactant proteins also can directly kill some infections by damaging their membranes. With gain-of-function viruses, it's a bit more diabolic. The spike proteins that these viruses make damage the very alveolar type 2 lung cells that make our lung surfactants. In military terms, this is called a preemptive strike. This is where you destroy your opponent's ability to fight you. Another name for this is a sucker punch. When spike proteins damage these alveolar type 2 lung cells, this decreases our lung surfactants. When spike proteins damage these alveolar type 2 lung cells, this decrease in our lung surfactants not only makes it harder for the lung's immune system to recognize and fight the viruses, the person actually starts to drown. The technical term for fluid building up in the lungs is acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. While very few people go all the way to ARDS, a lot of people who are suffering from spike protein toxicity will end up with some degree of water in their lungs, compromising their breathing. A fourth challenge is self-spreading vaccines. According to researchers at Oxford University, some 72% of all humans have had at least one COVID vaccine. It would seem that those behind this safe and effective medical experiment are not satisfied with 72%. They want to get everyone with the next vaccine, and now they found a way. Their idea is to create a self-spreading vaccine. Once a handful of people are vaccinated, they will spread the vaccine to others through contagion. They sneeze, and you get vaccinated. This technology already exists. This is, of course, a violation of the Nuremberg Codes, the principles of informed consent and basic human morality, but such is the world we live in now. So we must prepare a defense for this, and to do that we must first understand exactly what we are confronting. How do self-spreading vaccines work? One version uses a technology called Therapeutic Interfering Particles, or TIPS. TIPS, we are told, are harmless viral fragments that on their own cannot cause any trouble. They are inert and only become activated in the presence of a virus. Once activated, TIPS causes the virally infected cell to make a second set of particles called virus-like particles, or VLPS. It is these VLPS that then stimulate our T and B cells in our immune system to give us immunity to the target virus. At least, that's the theory. We're told that once the body clears the virus, the TIPS can no longer make VLPS, and the process is complete, the person now has immunity to that strain of the virus. But what happens if the body is unable to clear the virus? What if the virus becomes chronic? Alternately, what if the virus mutates to a form that can coexist with the TIPS? In both cases, TIPS would continue to generate VLPS. All right, what would happen to someone that kept making VLPS in their body? The outcome would be a continual triggering of the immune system, in addition to being highly inflammatory, this would also focus the body's immune resources on that particular virus at the expense of being able to deal with other infections we might have or be exposed to. Another outcome has to do with how VLPS self-assemble. The inventors of these technologies tell us that VLPS can self-assemble from morphed proteins. What does this mean exactly? Morphed proteins means prions. If you've watched our videos on our albidextrin product, you'll know that prions are the toxic misfolded proteins that can cause mad cow disease, senility, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, Lou Gehrig's, and all other manner of neurologic conditions. Self-assembly means VLPs grow like crystals, damaging tissues and creating blood clots as they get larger and larger. Here's three photos of VLPS growing as a crystal. You can see in these three images over time how the crystal is getting larger and larger. Sounds like a science fiction movie, right? Well, actually it is. In 1971, the movie The Andromeda Strain was released. 
It was about a disease that was killing people by clotting their blood. In this movie, people are dying from what they think is some kind of contagious infection. Eventually, the scientists figure out that it's not an infection in the classical sense. The deaths are being caused by, you guessed it, a self-assembling crystal. The crystal kept growing and growing until it killed its host by clotting the blood. Eventually, scientists figured out that these self-assembling crystals were pH dependent, and so disaster was averted. And what do you find in the research papers of the scientists that made these self-spreading TIPS vaccines? They are, you guessed it, pH dependent. So can we use pH to protect ourselves like they did in the movie? No. We'd have to go so acidic or alkaline to stop these self-assembling proteins that we'd have other problems. And even if we did, the moment we went back to a normal healthy pH, the crystals would start to form again. Okay, what about avoiding these self-spreading vaccines? Unlikely. In the 1917 influenza, even Eskimos in remote Alaskan villages got infected. All right, here's the good news. One researcher mentioned that these self-spreading vaccines won't work well with a strong innate immunity. So that's one strategy I think we should use. The other is to find something to bind these TIPS and VLPS and neutralize them. TIPS and VLPS fall somewhere between viruses and particulate matter. While we don't know for a fact that lung surfactant proteins can neutralize these particles, we do know that lung surfactant proteins can neutralize both particles and viruses. Also, lung surfactant proteins are part of our innate defense. So it would seem that supporting lung surfactant proteins satisfies both of these strategies. A fifth challenge is fluid in the lungs. We all know that water in the lungs is bad, but why? If you pour some water onto a countertop and then put a flat pot on the water spill and then try to lift the pot off the counter, it will be difficult. This is not because the water sticks to the countertop or the pot, but because water sticks to itself. This is called surface tension. The same situation happens in the alveoli. When we inhale, the alveolar sacs expand, and when we exhale, they contract again. If there is water in the alveoli, surface tension makes it hard for them to expand, just like it's hard to lift a flat pot off a wet countertop. Water in the alveoli makes inhalation more difficult. To deal with water in the lungs, we rely on lung surfactant proteins B and C to displace water from the alveoli. To show how fast lung surfactant proteins B and C can remove water from the lungs, look at these slides of people who experienced near drowning. On the left of the top four pairs of images, you can see that the lungs are darker. And then 24 hours later, on the right of the four pairs, you can see the lungs are brighter. This was after lung surfactant administration to near drowning victims. The darker color is due to water in the lungs, and the lighter color is indicative of water being removed from the lungs. In the lower two pair of images, you can see the dark spots showing water in the lungs is also diminished 24 hours after lung surfactant administration. Given that the body's response to particulate matter in the alveoli, leaky lung membranes from lipopolysaccharides, natural and man-made viruses, spike proteins, self-spreading vaccines, and water in the lungs may all be supported by lung surfactant proteins, it would seem wise to make sure that our lung surfactant systems are in good working order. To this end, I've created Alvectin. The proprietary yeast extract in our Alvectin product may support all four of the body's lung surfactant proteins, A, B, C, and D. While lung surfactant proteins are made in the lungs, they may be of benefit anywhere in the body. Our liposomal formulation helps protect this valuable extract from digestion and makes it available to all the tissues of the body. If you have any questions about our Aldectin product, feel free to call us or send us an email. Take care.